uh, report giving on etc usually when it comes to reports and this is and then we are able, we 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 leave recordings that in case of any any information that a student could give that could be confidential then it, it's not recorded but because this is more just interaction and learning that's still okay to be able to uh record so joe uh karibu sana thank you ashukuru asante um, I'm going to start by saying, first of all, um, I think just to echo a couple of things you have said. One is, remember this, and I always say this, this is something I learned from my mom and has been kind of a part of my life is, you are unique. We use that word very, very easily and loosely. But if you think about it, what's the population of the world now? Eight billion, nine, seven and a half billion. And just imagine there is not a single one like you not a single one like you. Sometimes if you think hard, that's actually quite mind boggling. But of all that of all that population, there's just you and there's nobody else like you. That kind of um, blows my mind sometimes. And I also want to say in the context of what the doctor uh, said, which was about um, being working hard and getting the reward. I'm going to share some three statements with you, which I think are really important can be a guide. The first one is, act as if you are, and you will attract to you. And when you act as if you are, you become. Let's just start thinking. So act as if you are, and you will attract it to you. And when you act as if you are, you will become. That's very much about you know the worry and the anxiety about about uh, you know sitting for exams and writing and everything else. If you have an intention, then intend, picture it in your mind, and you will achieve it. That's kind of the loose way of explaining it. The second bit I want you to, I want to share with you is, and this is something that's always guided me throughout my whole life, and I never knew the importance of this until actually I began to kind of go into some into self improvement and so on. And that is this. The world doesn't give you what you want. It gives you who you are. In other words, it's how you show up. So you can sit there all day and complain about life and everything else. That's exactly what you'll keep doing. You'll keep complaining. So it's about how you, how, how you show up. So the world does not give you what you want. It gives you who you are. Just wanted to share those those kind of those those two with you, and I suppose the third one is this: is um, is um, something about change and change of attitude. Uh, change is a constant, and that's very that's very that's really uh, appropriate within a mental health context. So change is a reality. So how you show up in the context of change is really important. Um, and believe you me, doing a PhD is a big change. And therefore, things don't happen to you, they happen for you. And I'm just saying that to you because, Dr. you talked about uh, an intense program like a PhD can can do a lot of uh, destabilization and so on, whether that's in your social life, in your relationships and so on. But things happen for you, and I know that too well. Uh, when I lost when we, when I lost my second daughter, that statement kind of challenged me. You know, things do not happen to you. My question was, why do you have to lose a daughter? That can surely be something happening for you. But it's taken me two and a half years to realize the importance of that. In other words, I've actually begun to experience a relationship with my other grown-up children than perhaps I was even aware of. And that is the gift of my second daughter passing away. That's a difficult one to come to, but um, there you go. Just wanted to share those three with you. Okay. Um, I'm going to take about 40 minutes. I'm really going to go through this fast. So uh, do forgive me because I know you've got a lot of time. Uh, you've got a big program. A program. Um, I'm going to share with you, I'm going to approach this slightly from a rebellious point of view in terms of mental health, because some mental health has become such a commonplace as a phrase, and sometimes we can lose, we can lose the true meaning of it. So I'm going to share that with you uh, in, in my presentation. So I'm going to share my screen now. I hope to God it works. 
technology has got its own problems. Uh, Oh, can you see it? Ah, there we go. Ah, voila, that was easy. <laughs> so, uh, can you see the screen? If you can, just uh, put your finger up so I can, I can, I can see. Can you see it? Awesome, great, thank you. Um, so, welcome to this. Uh, I want to invite you to, uh, so what I'm going to try and deal with here is something about uh, culture and cross-cultural perspectives on men, in men, it's supposed to be in mental health, and more importantly, the implications for practice, service design, and delivery. I've avoided the word multicultural to start with, but I will come back to it uh, uh, in the course of the presentation. Can you see everything on the screen clearly? I want to make sure you don't miss this. Yeah? Yes? Yes, we are doing uh, okay. You can use slide okay, good. slideshow if you want. Okay, that's what I'm doing. Oh, hang on. Uh, uh, slide control. No, I still have... no, I'll carry on. So long as you can see my screen, that's fine. Yeah, but you you can see you can see up there uh slideshow after animations design slideshow, and then you can begin from the beginning. Oh, where are we? Slide uh, control. File ho file home in search draw design up there on the bar, uh, on the toolbar, just just near where we have the file. Where you say file servers, then if you go across, uh, you get to. I can see participants. No, 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 uh, no, no. Just just on the share on your slide on your slide itself. Ah, on my oh, slide itself. Exactly. Go up there. Slide show. Oh, of no, no, course. No, 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 no. Don't have to go up, up after that. Design transitions, animations. Ah, okay, okay. Slide sorry, there. slide show. I should know from the beginning. From the beginning. Ah, uh, where are we? From the beginning. Yeah. You see, I might be clever. I'm not that clever when it comes yeah, to you're, technology. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Are you okay now? Uh, yeah. Click on it again. Click on from the beginning again. Just click on the from the beginning. Uh, where are we click, now? Click harder. I don't know if it, maybe that's the format. Okay, you click harder. All right, okay. If you can see it, can you see that now? Uh, that should be, mm, okay, you can go ahead. Can Another... you see, can you, can you see the full, the full, um, the full, yeah, the full I slide? I don't know, it's not giving a full screen. We can use another method. You know, uh, process, another one is if you go down completely down where yeah. you have where you have something like a, gla a glass a glass a wine glass. Can you see down there on the left? Yeah. Click on that. On uh, that 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 icon for like a glass a wine glass. Uh, did delete that's the video. This one here. All right. No problem. Um, if you can see my screen, it's okay. I mean, I can see it from this end. I'm not quite sure about you. Let me request. Uh, uh, that's okay. Let me request uh, your Zoom control. I can help that. Uh, I don't know if I've been given. Yes. I can approve it, yes. You can approve. I've and approved now, it, yeah. Let me see if I can uh, do the slide. Robert, when, I, when I've set the meeting, it automatically happens, you see, so. Oh, Okay. Yeah, so, because because I'm joining your meeting, I haven't got as much control. Okay, okay. Are we let okay? Me let me see if it's fine. Okay, that's fine. Okay, you're controlling that. That should be fine. Mm -hmm. You're at the boss now. I can't, I can't interfere with you until you give me back control. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, oh, be... I, can, I can go up and down. It's just I wanted to make sure you can see the whole thing. Okay. I, I don't, okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay. All right. I see hope. So, All right. welcome. Uh, what I'm sharing with you is something that um, I, I work with the, uh, every so often I work with the Center for Transcultural Psychiatry based in London. And um, so that's why I put in Daystar and Nairobi and Transcultural so, uh, 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 College in London. So, there we go. So what I'm going to explore is the role, relevance, and impact of culture on mental health practice. I'm also going to look at the impact 
on individuals and communities, but more importantly, the implications for cross-cultural approaches and practice. That's what I'm hoping to do. I'm going to share with you very quickly what I call a potted history of madness. And I've used the word madness very purposefully because that's actually the language that was used in psychiatry not until very long time ago. Hopefully we'll try and have a short and brief definition of culture. I also want to explore slightly something about, we talk about mental health and mental wellness and mental illness. So I'm going to try and uh, share with you very briefly what the difference between mental health and mental illness because I think it's important. And then some cultural concepts, meanings around mental health and mental well-being and the whole area of mental illness. That's what I'm planning to do. Also look at some cultural manifestations, how people present, and culture is important in terms of a, a, a people's presentation of their illness and distress. The impact of culture or mental well-being and mental illness, but also as a practitioner, as you will go out to practice in your world, looking at actually how you develop a sense of cross-cultural intelligence, wisdom, understanding, interpretations, perceptions that actually then impact on your practice. Um, and there's something I call um, being able to develop a cultural capability and competence, both as an individual, as a group, as a clinician, but also as organizations or as a service. Because uh, cross-cultural issues in mental health actually do require you to do that. And I can share, uh, uh, time permitting, I will share some of my own experiences working as a clinical, as a clinician in the UK, having come from Kenya in Kisi, in Western Kenya. So uh, I, I, I kind of had to, 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 um, to, to learn, to kind of begin to, to develop some cultural capability and competence. So a potent history of madness in psychiatry and mental health practice. I'm doing this for a very specific reason. Up until 19, until after independence in Kenya, pretty much our psychiatric services followed and pursued and were designed on the basis of British colonial experience in Kenya. And that didn't, didn't, didn't end until we actually changed the Mental Health Act. I think it was way back in 1963 after independence. But we were working with 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 a, a cultural a cultural perspective of mental health in Kenya, which was predominantly British and colonial, and that's why I've called the potted history because a lot of the language we use, even in our own legislation now, comes from there. So off we go. For about sixteen hundred years, actually, psychiatrists were never seen as real doctors until very recently they were they were considered as as funny doctors um quasi doctors they didn't practice real medicine as far as the medics were concerned so for over 1600 years we are talking about mental health being very crude medicine going back all the way to greek and roman times so people were actually purged you know, people went to actually they patched them and actually bled them to get rid of the bad spirits. And I'm not talking about Kenya or East Africa or Africa here. I'm talking about Europe here, by the way. Um, in mental health institutions, people were sat under cages of birds who were uh, pooed on them. There was this idea that actually if you had bad droppings on your head, they'll calm you down and they'll calm your mental well-being. People were put under a, a little jar and with water sipping and dripping on their head as part and parcel of the healing process. Again, I'm not talking about Kenya, I'm talking about Europe. The hospital I trained, I trained in London called um, Free and Hospital. Um, actually, we have a museum. There was a museum with all these things in them. And you can't really tell me, was this actually psychiatry? But that's how that's our journey psychiatry, even in Kenya. And um, it's only kind of during the Elizabethan times in the UK in the 16th century. Um, and remember, this is part of the world being colonized by Europe and everything else, that we begin to see the shoots of modern psychiatry. People who are, you know, people who are Psychologists were accepted because psychology was an accepted subject, but psychiatry, uh-uh. Um, but from now on, you began, to, people began to begin to so begin to see the relevance and perhaps with a big question mark of uh, the, the, the impact of psychiatry. And then you have in 1544, the setting up of the Insanity Act. Just listen to the terminology, the Insanity Act. 
this was actually in our Kenyan uh, uh, mental health system, as I say, during colonial times. So this was actually looking at people, it was a way of legislating in terms of how you control people who were considered to be mad, disordered, insane. Then in, in Europe, in the UK, I'm not going to bother you with the details. In 1550, they passed what was called the Poor Act, the Poor Law Act. This was just um, getting people into very crude, low level, poor, basic housing and controlling them. They actually, they actually turned in, in, in 1815 to what they called uh, mad houses for mentally ill. But actually, sometimes people were not actually mentally ill, people were just poor and they were ill. And they were distressed and emotionally and uh, emotionally um, uh, vulnerable. They were termed under whole madness because they were poor. That's why they called them the poor madhouses. Um, and until 1815, people who were mentally ill, as we know it today, were just allowed to roam around. Just think about that. They were, they were roaming around. Think of people. Until I knew about mental health, think about of all the people, certainly when I was growing up in towns in Kisumu, in Kisi, in Nairobi, in Nakuru, there were people who kind of walked around all day, you know, visiting bins and visiting rubbish heaps and everything else. And nobody bothered them because they were the other, they were mad. You never got you never got near them. We actually had one in Kisi, which is my hometown, when I was when I was a teenager. And um he was, I got to know later on, a, a, a paranoid schizophrenic. And we were all petrified of him because he used to run after people, but nobody bothered him when he was wandering around, talking to himself. That's what we, that's what we, we, we picked up. And what's interesting is uh, the beginning of the 19th century, 1808, they, they passed under an act in terms of actually how you build asylums or psychiatric hospitals as we know them this day, there were very there were very clear specifications in terms of where the amount of land, the design of rooms, the design of uh, safe places, and all that kind of stuff. And Madare Valley is actually built with that legislation in mind. Um, 1815, you've got nearly about 2,000 people in view, a few mud houses, and actually it all blew up then. Uh, in the 19th century, during the, the reign of Queen Victoria, we are we are coming up to you know we are coming up to colonization of of, of Africa here, and between 1827 and 1829, there were about nine asylums in the whole UK, uh, with an average occupancy of about 116. They were controlled again about design and whatever. Then 1890, you had the Lunacy Act. This is really the beginning. Of, uh, of, uh, of mental health as we know it today. But what's interesting, it was all conducted through the courts. Now, Madare Valley was a prison initially. Oh, no, actually, initially it was a, a leprosy place. Then it became a, a, a prison. Then it became a specialist hospital for people who were unwell, horrible people as they used to call them. Um, and in 1990, when Madare Valley was built, it was actually a very small area was used to uh, look after poor white people with uh, leprosy. And 95% of the occupants of Madare Valley were actually African people, Kenyan people, who were then known as insane, mad, and uncontrollable, and seen as, seen as criminals. Because remember, this legislation was set in place. Uh, to control people who were deemed disordered and, and unsafe and so on. Um, so that's that's the background of our, of our of our psychiatric services, including in Kenya. And during that time, some of the treatments were very crude. A lot of a lot of ECT, as we call it, electroconvulsive therapy, was actually a method of treatment quite quite regularly, especially for people who had paranoid paranoid uh, symptomatology, using water using insulin to treat people. Can you just imagine, these were non-diabetic people. They were actually treated using insulin um, because they were seen as the other. In the 50s then, there was a beginning, you're beginning to, to see a change in, in, in psychiatric movements, uh, in, in, in change in psychiatry. You're talking about Kenya here during colonial time, during their pricings and everything else, people were being controlled and managed 
through the 1950s legislation. And at the same time, you begin then to see the rise of people who are beginning to rebel against the psychiatry because they saw medicalization and the politicization of mental illness. Let's say, if I'm a person called Thomas, Thomas Sals, uh, um, was actually rebelling against this. And then uh, this was also the beginnings of beginning to develop medications for 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 uh, for for mental illness for psychiatry, chlorpromazine being one of them, or lagactyl, depending on which way you know it, and that medication is still around. It's actually the drug of choice for people in, in, in with with the schizophrenia. So the fifties became a time when. Uh, Hospitalization was very was very popular, and it's also at the same time you begin to see the development of the Mental Health Act legislation. I'll come to that in a minute. And this was the beginning of the emergence of uh, beginning to think about people being cared for in community away from hospitals. This was more because of the overcrowding and so on, rather than actually a, a, a humane bit. And uh, then you're also beginning to think about the emergence of uh, people being looked after in the community. And there's one particular champion of this. His name was Ronald David Lang. He was a Scottish psychiatrist. And his argument was that actually if somebody suffered from schizophrenia, it was an adjustment to a dysfunctional society. And therefore his argument, his contention in psychiatry was we need to begin to looking after people in the community within their own communities and not in hospitals. With very, very, uh, um, some of his experiments end up with some very disastrous outcomes. Because while as a concept, it was right because actually in this country they did, they did become the concept of community care. But at that time, it was people living in independent housing. People were clinically ill, psychotic in some instances. And um, I don't know if you call it a privilege or a, or, a, or a sad experience. Actually, as a trainee clinician in one of the oldest asylums in the UK, it used to be called Colney Hatch Lane Asylum, and they gave it a better name in Freehan Hospital because Freehan was the part of London it was in. I actually, in training, I worked with four people who were the outcome of the experiments of Dr. Lang failed experiments. They were all placed in long-term backward, backwards where they were just left because they just did not engage with the world. And in this context, then began the emergence of developing law, and very quickly they enacted the 1959 Act, which was actually the same act used in Kenya until after independence. So the 1959 Act also applied in colonial, uh, in colonial Britain. But the Act began to change from shifting from using control and prisons into a kind of social way approach to mental health. But still, in spite of the introduction of this kind of welfare approach to, to mental health, there was still a lot of control uh, and the mental health was still used as an, as an instrument of control. Remember, I'm talking about Kenya, but at the same time, I'm talking about the UK. That's why I wanted to give you this context that actually Kenya did not develop out of the blue. It has a history. There's a context to it. Um, and this kind of a 1959 act began to focus on, on, on people being seen as really human beings now, being seen as people who require help and care and support. Um, but still, the practice, a bit like Dr. Dr. Yuya talking about the, 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 the woman he, she was talking about, of, of, uh, she went to see in hospital, still mental people with mental illness were very much how shall I put this, substandard, not considered to be real patients. There was something wrong with them, they were the other. With the change of attitudes in the 70s and so on, people began to rebel against this concept of control, this concept of using medication to control people, this concept of politicizing mental ill health. But still, we call it stigma these days, but still, people who are mentally ill were still seen as the other. And rest, if I'm really honest about it, there's still some of that about. And then the 1959 Act, forget, sorry, it's not, it's not five, no, no, five, no, it's 1959 Act, was then in this country, uh, an act uh, was reviewed in 1982, and then uh, it became the 1983 Mental Health Care Act. Uh, 
Kenya had already begun changing that act post-independence. Uh, and while the, and the new Mental Health Act, just like in Kenya now in the 1922 uh, Mental Health Act in Kenya, um, they were looking at begin to, you begin to hear things about safeguarding human rights of individuals, patients, and you know patients' rights and the, the, the right to access civil uh, to, to access uh, aftercare when they're in inpatient care. So there's kind of a combination of the civil, legal, and social status of patients. You have to forgive me. I haven't I haven't looked at this recently. You might you might correct me here. I'm not quite sure how the new Mental Health Act in Kenya is actually panning out. And when I'm when I'm in Kenya next time, I want to do some just some um, some checking. So I just want to give you that long long kind of short potted history of Mental Health Act to set the context that actually Kenya's mental health development, mental health practice, mental health kind of uh, uh, ways forward were very much driven by British uh, mental health legislation, attitudes, practice, and culture. So, before we, we, sorry, before we go into uh, the, the meat of it, I just want, very quickly want to introduce something also that latterly has kind of been occupying my brain, and that is to really appreciate mental health mental well-being and mental illness, I think we need to take a step back and understand that actually as human beings, we are three-dimensional. There is the mind, we have got our mind, we have got our body, and we have got our soul. And I'm not using soul in the religious sense, I'm using soul in terms of those systems that actually keep us alive even when we are not aware of it. So I'm talking to you now. I had uh, a banana before. My body is digesting that away. It has nothing to do with it. It has no relationship with me talking to you. It's walking away. That's the kind of uh, thing. And, and mental health, and good mental health and good mental well-being is really the equilibrium between mind, body, and soul. And if you take away one of those, there is an imbalance. And that's why people are, are then exposed to mental, mental illness. So it's really important to understand that because when somebody is mentally healed, it affects their emotions, it affects their physical well-being, it affects their existence, it affects the way they perceive themselves. It actually affects how the other systems in their body work. And that's really, really important to understand when you begin to talk about cross-cultural uh, um, uh, mental mental health practice or when you begin to talk about practice and assessments and uh, formulations, you need to understand that. So much so that actually I think that um, if, if if sometimes we need to focus a lot in the in the physical well-being of people with mental health problems because that has an impact on their emotions, their well-being, and so on. Just wanted to throw that in. So it affects how we think, how we behave, and how we act. And uh, you can already begin to see the therapy here, CBT, how we behave, how we think, how we act. Uh, that's the base of CBT, basically. And mental health is about emotions. It's about how people feel. When somebody's in distress, it impacts on their emotions. Um, and emotion is just a it's just a, a long word which actually explains energy in motion. That's why our feelings are really, really important. Dr. Ayuya talked about when, when, when the driver mentioned about his wife being in pain. What was lacking in all that is the feelings. So what was driving the clinicians probably, what are the symptoms? But actually not being aware that actually those symptoms are, are, are manifested in the way somebody feels, in this particular case, pain. So we can't, we can't take away mental health from a socio-philosophical context. We can't take it away from a, a socio-anthropological contact. It's very much about relational relationships. There's also the issue about the power dynamics, whether we like it or not, in mental health and also in political power and professional debates. You know, we are trained as professionals that we hold a certain element of power in terms of actually how we determine how, how then a patient's journey takes place. Think of the example Dr. Yu has just shared with us. The poor woman had three different definition um, uh, um, uh, diagnoses, and until Doctor Ayia began to pry 
into actually widely differentiation, ask the questions. Why was she able to do that? Because she had professional power, authority rather. And then there's issues around the geopolitical consequences of mental health. Uh, and, and, you know, mental health is at the very center of fashion. Funny as it might sound, fashion is about being seen good, being kind of whatever, but the pressure that comes with it has mental health consequences. I don't need to explain that to you. You just need to look at all the people uh, in high fashion, the kind of pressure they go through. So, Let's go with culture. So what is culture? I'm going to start, like I said, I'm going to start from a kind of rebellious point of view. To understand, I think, cultural perspectives in mental health, you need to understand how organizations are constituted. Now, in the Western world, it's very much driven by a philosopher who was called René Descartes, or Cartesian, Cartesian philosophy, as it's called. And in his... Uh, in his um, thesis on the discourse on method, he argued in Latin, he says, cogito ego sum, which means in English, I think, therefore I am. Just look at the second sentence, I think, therefore I am. In other words, the determinant of truth was something uh, subjective. I determined the truth. I determined what's right. You can begin to see the emphasis on my rights, my my you know my thinking, my my life, and everything else. And everything was very much about I, me, myself. If I didn't determine, if I didn't uh, define something as appropriate, then it doesn't matter what anybody else thought. This has consequences. And if you look at the whole of Western culture, it's very much individually driven, and this is where it comes from. I think, therefore, I am. The complete opposite, certainly in, in, in Kenyan culture, um, I think I'm pretty safe saying in African culture, it's the exact opposite. And Professor Andi, Dr. Mbiti, uh, in his book, uh, is, is, is a guy who really talked about uh, African traditional religions and philosophy, and within that was the health component. We switch this thing around, and we talk about sumus ego sum, sum therefore, in English translated is, we are, therefore I am. In other words, what gives us our identity as human beings, well or unwell, is our communities. And that's very much how we define ourselves. Um, they define who we are. To a certain extent, they define what we become, our communities. And those communities give us our identity and therefore what drives us. And I think there's still elements of those now, if I'm really honest, is we, us, and then me. Not the other way, not the Cartesian way. And that has implications for mental health. Because if somebody's mentally ill in the Western world, it becomes the individual that is the problem. It's only very recently that mental health practice, we are talking about the last 30 years, where mental health practice actually located the individual within their community, within their immediate family, their extended family, because it has implications for them. Um, and then when we come, when we look at culture as a, this is a very general, when, when you look at the Oxford English Dictionary and the Cambridge Oxford Dictionary and the whatever other dictionary, Culture seems to come to basically the institutions, the beliefs, the actions, traditions, practice, folklore, art, music, a shared sense of wisdom, the literature, music, and ways of being of any cult, of any society, and the meanings they give to those, to those uh, 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 interactions. That's what culture is. It includes how we think, it includes how we communicate in terms of language, actions have meanings, customs have meanings, it, we are talking about beliefs and values and institutions, whether they are racial, ethnic, religious, uh, whatever. All those are important, and there's only, there's so many, there's cultures across the world, hence the cross-cultural component in this particular lecture, because to be able to engage and make sense of mental illness and mental well-being, you need to have an appreciation of people's culture in the context of their beliefs, their, their institutions, their own, and everything else. 
So um, that's just a, a very loose definition of what culture is. Um, I skip that. That's not that's not important. So, so in 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 psychiatry in Kenya and the UK, there is a cult. Like I said before, current modern day psychiatry has actually got a Western bias. The interpretations, the meanings that were given to them, how the meanings that are translated into behavior were seen from a Western perspective, Eurocentric. And therefore, the kind of institutions that were set up to, to, to engage with that were very seen from a Eurocentric point of view. Um, so, for instance, um, not such a long time, a lot of the people who actually went into mental hospitals in the uh, in the early 50s and early 60s, a third of them were people with learning disabilities. They had no mental health at all. Um, women who became pregnant out of wedlock, went into mental health. And when I was training, this was the bulk of the people we worked with. And actually, they had no mental health problems at all. They, kept, they were put into an asylum away from their homes. And they began, we, we talked about, they become institutionalized. And in a context of people with mental health problems, they began to behave like people with mental health problems. But actually, in terms of clinically, as a clinical diagnosis, they didn't have a mental health problem. But this was society controlling the undesirables, the other outside of the community, because it was deemed mad, bad, wrong, evil, if you had a child outside of wedlock. Again, I'm talking about Europe here. So all those things are important when we begin to think about about uh, about uh, mental health. Let's let's shift this to Kenya, for instance, and I'm going to uh, kind of focus on a couple, a few things here. If we're really honest, still people are uncomfortable in Kenya if you have a child out of wedlock. That's just the truth. We might disagree with it. I mean, it's it's a lot more in inverted commas, acceptable. But if you drill down a little bit, there is an, there's elements of discomfort and a sense of um, not quite authentic because you're not married. Now, that's a cultural perspective. So now you can imagine if a woman, a girl like that, goes into labor as a child and God forbid uh, you know develops puerperal psychosis their journey is going to be a difficult one because it's driven by those cultural perspectives and as a clinician in Kenya now today you need to be conscious of that you need to start to, 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 to start to think in terms of actually where and how is this person going to be assisted and 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 and, and engaged with in, in, in society. Think of that, for instance, to when I was growing up. Any woman who had a child in Kenyan society, the community took over. I can remember when my aunts had children all the women in our, in our extended family actually took over control of the home. Now, they were providing a pretty essential and really effective psychiatric service without knowing it. Because what they were giving is they were giving the woman who has just had birth space to rest, to bond, and therefore minimizing the potential, the potential development of post, uh, postpartum psychosis or uh, or puerperal psychosis. Now, this was this was part of the culture. You know, this was protecting mom. This was making sure that mom rested. I think is the word they used to use. And I remember my grandmother sitting there and taking charge of everybody who was around and making sure the kids were fed. Very practical things, but they were actually providing a very very essential psychiatric 
protection, mental well-being protection service, avoiding this particular trauma ending up in a mental illness. They didn't know it was mental. They were, they were, actually, they were, actually, they were actually providing mental health support, something really critical. Now, that is a cultural perspective, a cultural understanding of the importance of a child in a community, the importance of the community to protect the mom who is the child, who, you know, who is the mother of the child, so that she's well, so she can grow strong and get, I think the, the phrase they use is get her energy back before she can start, you know, looking up other things. Now, what's interesting is, and galling when you look at it today, somehow the man disappeared amongst all this. And I can, I can I I could see it from my own uncles and from my own you know extended cousins and so on. These guys they still expected their wives to want to cook for them. The mom who was being protected and supported by these other women, you would think that actually the husband would take charge of making sure that the other children are fed. No. Because of the cultural perceptions and meanings, the women who came to support mom, somehow one of them still cooked for the children. And the husband sat there, you know, in his kingdom. You know, those, are the, those, are, those are cultural perspectives in terms of approaching mental well-being. And I think in the context of, uh, of uh, maternity care and so on, that becomes really important, actually, how we begin to involve families, immediate families of the person, you know, uh, um, who may be diagnosed with a mental illness, how they are going to be supported at home by whom, how the children are going to be taken care of. If the person is at school, like yourself at university, what kind of help and support are you going to receive so that actually you can still carry on with your course or, or carry on with your degree and everything else. That's, that's culturally driven. Now, in our current context, it's even a lot more risky because we are in between cultures. There's, there's a, almost a, a cross-cultural combination of Western understanding and practicing mental health and the pressure to conform to the culture we have grown up in. Well, certainly for me, given the time I grew up, that was something very visible. And when I came into practice in the UK, or even when I actually began kind of getting involved in health, you know, helping working in dispensaries in Kenya and so on, you could see this at work in dispensaries, health health centers. So both our cultural perspectives can be both good and bad. In the context of the UK, because of that thing of, that thing of because I think therefore I am, because it's very individualist, the focus was very much about the person you know, the person being taken care, taken care of uh, when they're in inpatient care. When they go home, nothing happens. And it's only latterly, especially in kind of the beginning of the 80s, when we began to look at actually what environment is this person going to go back to? Family. What's the extended family? What are the pressures? Have they got money problems? Have they got housing problems? Are they a single mother? Are they a single, a single parent? So I just wanted to share that kind of a approach to, 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 to kind of the, cult the cultural concepts being both a barrier and uh, an aid. Then look at diagnosis. It's very much steeped again in, in, in Western culture. And, seen, and this is where kind of West, where Western culture, and I call it Kenyan culture as opposed to African culture, because uh, I know Kenya's in Africa, but I want to narrow it down. Now, Doctor, I don't know if any, I don't know if all of you caught the phrase that Doctor Ajiya mentioned, which is talking about. Unfortunately, still, it's a lot of a lot of people. A lot of people in mental health services are women. Uh, that is not to say because women are more ill. I suppose it's just women because of the cultural expectations are more likely to exhibit the symptoms of mental well-being. Again, that's a culturally driven bit. So when we are diagnosing women, uh, and Dr. Yuya, you might disagree with me here, or you might, you might, but it's actually, you know, we will tend more often than not to diagnose women as suffering from depression because both as a Eurocentric perspective and uh, as a cultural person in Kenya, because women are seen to be emotionally a lot more visible. 
it's okay for a woman to cry. That's how I was brought up. It's okay for girls to cry. You know, boys don't cry. They are men. You don't cry. You, you hold in your, you hold in your, 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 your feelings. And therefore, it's not surprising, for instance, that actually women are more diagnosed in, in mental health as having mental health problems as opposed to men. If then it's diagnosed as men, because men tend to be abrasive and so on, the likelihood is men will tend to be diagnosed with more psychotic symptoms, even if they are not. That is both here in the UK, in the Western world, but also in our own cultures, because women, and I suspect is, they are actually more frightened of the experience, and therefore they exhibit a lot more uh, um, exuberant behavior. So the attribution of meaning and the language we use and our behavior in the face of uh, mental health in a Kenyan context, take even in a Kisi context, in a Kikuyu context, in a Luo context, may be determined partly by the perceptions we have about how those communities conduct their lives. But that seems to be a generally shared concept across Kenya. Most communities in Kenya are actually, if you are mentally unwell, then maybe somebody looked at you with an evil eye. That, you know, somebody spat at you or somebody um, wished you unwell, wished you evil. Then we throw in the whole issue of witchcraft and so on. It wasn't any different here such a long time ago. Witches were burned on the stake because of religious influence, but they were seen as evil influences. And that's how kind of mental health, people with mental illness were perceived. The other, not quite understood, we can't see the illness, therefore we'll treat them as the other, therefore excluded, or as we call it today, stigma. And that's the attribution of this unknown to something we don't understand, therefore we will give you we will attribute you to something either evil, criminal, or bad, and therefore exclude you. And both cultures, whether it's individual driven or uh, culturally driven, have got consequences, good and bad. Now, I'm going to digress slightly, and talk to, when it comes to actually um, uh, a prognosis, for people being mentally and kind of recovering from mental mental wellness, mental illness, it's actually the very simple societies. Actually, the prognosis for people there is far much better than in society, for instance, here in the UK, for a variety of reasons. People still live in the rural areas. People still tend the gardens. People still have conversations. People kind of are tolerated, and they kind of carry on with their life. They are not seen as evil and threatened, and they tend to get better sooner than people, somebody in the UK, for instance. Just a, a, a slight digression. Uh, this is just an example of a colleague of mine, um, the Inuit, for instance. They have no name. The Eskimos have no name for specific mental health. They haven't got a name for mental health. So they describe in their language, Inukitut, they describe it in terms of four dimensions. It's actually seen as a physical and environmental issue, as a psychological, emotional issue, or as demon or spirit possession. Or somebody has acquired a different culture, therefore they have gone mad because they don't adhere to our culture. That's how the Eskimos perceive mental well-being, which is actually pretty close to African culture. Because, because we can't see the mental illness, we begin to look at environmental issues. We explain them in, psycho in, in psychological terms, in emotional terms, and that's explained in langu the language we use. And very often, people who are this way inclined, they will tend to be mainly you know, disadvantaged, poor, in every sense of the word, and that has an impact in terms of actually how then they are perceived as being poor, first of all. And that actually then determines how the society responds to them. In Sub-Saharan Africa, <laughs> our mental well-being, this is going to sound really odd, is tied in with the land, with our relationship with the land, with our relationship with our ancestors, and, the, and, 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 and our relationship with each other. 
what I call the mundane. And when, when I say, just give you a practical example, when I say I am going home, I don't mean the house I am going to. I mean the land that I grew up in. I mean the soil that I kind of step on. I mean where my grandparents were buried. I mean where uh, life takes place that ties us as a family. I mean the safety of knowledge and familiarity of the morals, the norms, and so on. That's what going home means. So you can imagine an African student comes to the UK to study in a new, in a completely new society, alien society, no, no relationships, no knowledge of other people if they are unlucky, and they are faced with discrimination, you can begin to see the problem. They, they are fearful, they are uncertain of what's right, what's wrong. We are, this, is, this is a mental health bomb you know, beginning to, 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 to develop. And you just need to introduce extreme anxiety, extreme pressure, extreme distress, and they end up being mentally ill. And it's interesting in this country, right up to now, when it comes to new students, or actually now even students in the UK away from home, when it comes to pressure points like exam times or change times, they get very distressed. And that's why we developed the whole concept of mental well-being and mental, mental uh, what I call uh, uh, um, preventative mental well-being in universities, in schools, in primary schools, in secondary schools. And, and as I to go back to what I was talking about in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's something about this concept of the mundane, the earth, and the relationship with God and the spirits, what I call the transcendent. That's very much at the core of our mental well-being. Why? Because when somebody is ill, they'll talk about going home. They want to go to a familiar place because they can recognize people, they know their names. They might begin to talk in terms of actually, maybe I did not do something to actually that displaced my ancestors, the transcendent, or maybe I've done something that has displaced God. And we begin to describe mental health in that context. That has got problems because um, a mental illness, a mental illness got nothing to do with God or earth or whatever. It's just a symptomatology. But unfortunately, we begin to make sense of it in that context. Therefore, the understandings and the relationships in our society with God or with each other or with our community or understanding of our community's expectations of us all begin to feature and figure in terms of actually how, when you become mentally unwell, how you're going to, how your journey is going to be. In Eastern cultures, it's very much about equilibrium. I talked about the three components of us, mind, body, and soul. Mental well-being is, 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 is contextualized in the context. Actually, if you're in equilibrium, then you're mentally well. And if you're not, then you're mentally unwell. And that's interesting, actually, how, especially in the West now, we are importing a lot of Eastern philosophy into, into European or Western mental health, meditation. Um, what do we call it? Uh, mindfulness, yoga, exercise. It's interesting how these things have been brought back, have been brought into the mental health arena. Why? Because they're about, if we, looked at our, if we look after our body, and we look after our mind, then we are likely to be in equilibrium and therefore mentally well. So almost by default, we have adopted an Eastern cultural perspective of mental illness. Now, I go running in the morning as well as maintaining my own mental health. I spend some quiet moment as well as maintaining my own mental health. Sometimes I use some Kenyan music because it calms me down, it also brings, brings me back home in my mind. That's how I manage my mental well-being. And if you look at what you do now in Kenya and elsewhere in the world, it starts. We are beginning to uh, use non-clinical, non-medicinal 
ways of actually sustaining and managing mental well-being. So, for instance, uh, when the asylums were designed, they were designed in a particular way that to be in a very open space. People could go out of the walls and go for a walk in the fresh air. They could walk in the gardens. They could go flowers. It wasn't an accident. It was an understanding of that tripartite concept of humanity, mind, body, and soul. And if you calm the mind when your symptoms are, are, are acute, you're likely to calm to your, your experience of being mentally unwell. Think of Kenya. Think of the people who roam about, you know, even now, you know, people sometimes, some of the people who actually we find in Kisumi in towns who, who, who beg for money, uh, they start poor and they actually being, end up mentally unwell because they are rejected. Nobody acknowledges them. Nobody says even hello to them. Some people abuse them when they see them. Some people are being horrible to them. You can imagine what all that does to somebody's psychological status and therefore somebody's psychological and emotional well-being and the impact on their mental well-being. And if they're not mentally and mentally well, then they're likely to actually develop clinical mental illness. So, like, like in the Eastern cultures, people are actually, you know, still go and, certainly in Indian places like in, in, in Southeast Asia, people still go and, and visit um, traditional healers for their advice and wisdom to manage their mental well-being, even to look at relationships. You know, maybe the relationship with your husband and wife is not so that that's why you've gone mad. Why? It may be just pure physical sexual abuse. It may be emotional abuse. It may be whatever any form of abuse. But because of the cultural context, because of this wise traditional healer person who has some kind of respect and acknowledgement in society, they give a sense of advice which has nothing to do with the clinical component, but actually is, is interpreting all this in the context of what I, what I call it before, the mundane and the transcendental. You know, do you go to church? Maybe because you have stopped going to church, maybe, you know, that's probably why you're feeling unwell. Maybe you're not, you know, you're not, you're not visiting your grandmother very often now these days, or maybe you're doing A, B, C, and D and, and all that kind of stuff. Therefore, places of worship become important. You know, we go to church and Hindu temples have become places where people get provided mental health. Christian churches and Christian worship places have actually become places of sanctuary. And I think they should be, especially uh, in the Catholic church. I've always criticized my own, I come from a Catholic tradition and I've always had arguments with preachers and priests and so on about actually why don't we open our churches for the care and support and well-being of people with mental health problems? Ah, but it's a place of worship. Why? If it's a place of worship, all the more reason why why we should have people using those contexts because they are safe places. They are a safe haven. They are quiet places. They are places of calm and solitude. If you can begin to see how everything now becomes becomes integrated into our mental well-being, um, the language we use about mental, you know, the one that really caught my attention was how I was working with a, a group of uh, Asian women in Leicester, this is in the centre of England, eastern part of England, and it's the phrase she used about describing her mental well, her mental wellness. I've got sadness in my heart. Remember we talked about in some cultures they haven't got an M for mental health, but the only way she could explain her distress and mental and emotional distress was to refer to it as a sadness in my heart. Now that may sound like a very simple statement, but it's actually a very rich statement because the heart is always associated with, with life and being and living. And therefore, there was something wrong with her heart, and that's why she was feeling unwell, mentally. It's also, the heart is also the center of emotion, certainly from Greek and Roman mythology. Therefore, you know, but just in that sentence, she was able to explain her mental unwellness. Think of Kenya, for instance. You talk to somebody in Kwambia, ah, two two. These days you say poor. Uh, and then usually there will be a statement that follows, lakini, and then they don't say anything. Or lakini, and they make a sound, lakini, hmm. 
those are telltale signs. VPR, there on the skia hoi hoi, is what they used to use when I was growing up. Tupo tupo tula kiliko hoi hoi. It's trying to say there is something emotionally unwell about me. So they are at the same time saying, yes, I'm okay, but. So physically, I may look okay to you, but there's things going on in me that don't happen. You know, uh, relationships. You might just hear somebody, a woman saying, well, you know, omogaka in Kisi, or mze or I don't know what the Lua name is. I've forgotten my now. But what they're saying to you is just in that one word, omogaka mze, it's either emotional abuse or sexual abuse or sexual violence. And unless you tune, you understand the meanings of words and actually that allows you to tune into the unsaid. So if somebody says, you know, poor, lakini mze, is the tone with which they say that. Or if it's a mze, it's the way they, sp they talk about wife. Or if it's a girl or a young man, you might be talking about their dad. It's, 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 it's the tone with which they say it after they have said poor. poor. And as mental health practitioners, we need to tune into that. Because that's, that's the cultural overload. That's the cultural laden meanings that we are um, that we, um, we, um, uh, uh, going to. Now, I was staying with my cousin in Jogo a few years back. And we were talking to a friend of his who was very nicely dressed and whatever. And we were I don't know what we were talking about. And then it came. And then he just said, ah, Nairobi, hali ya nyumba, sikuizi. It's all he said. And I just said to myself, I'm going to check this out. Now, those of you who know Nairobi, I think it was, it's near the, what used to be the, um, what used to be the, the supermarket on Jogo Road. Um, anyway, near a bridge. And I just said, okay, you know, let's walk home. And when I, when I walked home with him, I understood exactly what I'd suspected. He was still living in the public housing that was built during the colonial period and where that guy lived i could understand why he was feeling and behaving the way he did it was inhumane so the cultural bit is important to tune in in terms of what words mean what noises mean because that's where the cross-cultural intelligence that's how you begin to develop your cross-cultural intelligence and capability. Or people might present to you in somatic symptoms. Ah, doctor is sikwisi vizuri. Or he might be talking, a woman might be talking to a, a, you know, a fellow, a fellow friend of hers or a man or a sikwisi si juini baridi si juini nini. Because they can't, you know, they, so they actually begin to describe that in in, in somatic terms. In, in, in clinical in, in clinical practice, we call it uh, medically unexplained symptoms. So somebody comes to you with a list of of, uh, of physical symptoms, but actually when you go through the exams and everything else, the, the screening and everything else, there's nothing physically, medically wrong with them. But that's how they present. As I talked about the VP hoi, Nuskia hoi, Baridi, Mama, Zenini. So tune into what the cultural meanings, what the cultural words mean. And might, you know, it might be a Lua person with a particular phrase, which might be different from a Kisi person, because Luas tend to be, uh, um, they tend to be uh, um, nomadic. They're mainly fishers. Therefore, th there's phrases and words that actually mean things. Or if you go into Meru or in Kukuyuland or in the slopes of Mount Kenya, there's words. If I can remember my, my, my Kimeru says, you know, muga uh, 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 kuga, and then, some, then something gets dropped in. And that's usually the telltale sign. So culture can be both a blessing and a curse depending on whether, so if, if, if we talk about you are defined by your community, 
that becomes a big pressure because if the community does not subscribe to somebody being potentially ill, they are likely to treat you as an outsider. But at the same time, if it's a community that still sees you and as, as you know, you have been okay, you have been a mother, you have looked at the children and they, and they take you on, then that becomes your sanctuary. I remember this very, very stuck clearly as if it was yesterday. We had my cousin's grandmother and she definitely was unwell. I didn't know that she was suffering from schizophrenia, but she was definitely unwell. And I remember as soon as you began to see sunset, she began talking to herself. She began shouting at people. And um, we were, I was afraid of her because uh, we had known her as a woman who was kind and receptive and everything, but she had changed. And, you know, my, my cousin's uncle went to get a, a, you know, a, a local medicine person to come and cure her. And then at night she was howling and screaming and we could hear. And I used to go and say to my cousin, you know, we need to go and have a look at your grandmother because something wrong. But the interesting thing is, because she was never dangerous, she was still able to be accepted. People still went in and visited her. They made sure she had water in the house. We made sure she had, she had food. We made sure that her doors were closed. And not knowing any psychiatry at all, that's how we managed her. Why? It was driven by culture respect for an older person, making sure they are safe and everything else. So those, those positive components of culture actually became the saving grace. If you are if, if you are in this particular world, part of the world, because you're on your own, you can actually end up in your own house and that's it. Nobody sees you, nobody visits you because it's very much about individual individualism. Now it's changed significantly because now in mental health practice we tend to we have tended to look at the social context of the person we are we are working with or we are we are, or we are diagnosing or we are helping. So 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 culture can be both and understanding for instance um, you know the importance of a hindu a hindu gurudwara or somebody of hindu going to church as part of managing them is really important so you want to put them in in, in touch with their community to go to church with them and and you know the muslim the, you know the muslim um, uh, uh, mosque so these things become so unless you understand what that means, the Muslim, the Hindu, the African guy from West Africa, East Africa, from from Mount, from Meru or from Luo, you begin to understand these things. Different experiences, different generalizations. I've tried to capture all that in that diagram. So if you're thinking about cross-cultural issues in mental illness, those are everything. And well-being is predicated by that. Um, so symptoms are the are the things we deal with. But actually, it's, it's where do the symptoms come from? We are looking at behavior. We are looking at language. We are looking at um, potential for that for for prognosis. And what are the things we need to incorporate in all these areas uh, to, to actually make 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 sure it's well. Again, to go back to what, where Dr. Ayuya began, the gender roles. There is still a lot of pressure for women in our societies about how they should behave, what they should do, what they can't do, what they're allowed to do. And remember, our children pick that up and we transmit those roles. And part of the chaos and the dissonance between older and younger people has to do with the younger people have begun to question some of the roles and gender issues and so on. It's the same here. Just make you laugh. We talk about, you know, you know, women in the world are seen more equal. Hmm, I've got my question mark. If anybody in this country wants to buy a kitchen, Unless they consult with their wife, they're in big trouble. Because somewhere, somehow, still, the woman is seen as the person who controls what happens in the kitchen. That is a cultural perspective for you. And we are talking about the 21st century here. Now, I'm not saying that happens everywhere, but it's, in it's interesting what we declare and what the actual practice is. And I go back to where, where Dr. You started about, about you know, the, the, the bit about, uh, you know, asking people, 
Why the three different diagnoses? That's all about power. They were all good hospitals, but it was the clinicians were focused just on the symptomatology. They didn't want to check what has happened recently. Any previous, uh, I don't know, um, abortions or any previous um, uh, unborn children, uh, you know, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. And it's interesting, you are the standard. The first, Dr. Hayes talked about that, the standard. If something like that, controlling about stomach problems, I didn't think about pregnancy. So we are talking about the kind of standards that we share in a given culture that might be the keys to get into how we engage with someone with mental health problems. I'm nearly there. So I suppose this kind of repeats what I was talking about. Because of uh, those cultural constraints, people may be seen inequitably, may be approached differently. So a psychiatrist in a Kenyan context talking to a, you know, diagnosing a woman, a male psychiatrist, may have um, limitations because of the gender issue and vice versa. Believe you me, even if you are a practicing professional as a woman or man, unless you're, you're, you need to be honest with yourself that actually either the person in your diagnosis or you because of your, your unconscious programming carry those stereotypes with you and you need to catch yourself when they are coming into your clinical practice unless you're a very self-aware person. So explore, understand, ask questions about different cultures. Ask, you know, when I was speaking to somebody from, I don't know, Ukraine, and they said this, what do they mean, actually? What does that mean? Be curious. Ask each other. Check out when, what, what people take as wrong. Whatever. Just give me two seconds. I'll just have the bell and, and knock on the door. Right, so I hope you're getting a fresh breath of a different voice, a different perspective on culture, and um, hopefully this gives you a new, uh, you know, some additional perspectives around, uh, you know, culture. Um, I like, you know, Sorry, what's the postman? Am, <laughs> yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm near, I'm nearly done now. So really. If, there's, if, there's, if there is one message I'm going to say at this stage about cross-cultural is in mental health, it is be curious about meanings. That's why I'm very much interested in languages. I'm really into, uh, languages fascinate me. So for instance, if, uh, if, you, if you're speaking to an Italian, their hands are going all over the place and they've got some symbols that actually mean things. Now, unless you're an Italian, you won't understand what that is. I'm sure the same is in Kenya. We have got signs that actually um, mean things. We have got, you're talking to somebody and they just make a noise. You have got to contextualize that. That's how you begin to, that's how you begin to develop your cross-cultural wisdom and intelligence about how you deal with people. Just to give you an example, looking after all the people in residential homes here, Assigning a 75-year-old woman, whether it's a nurse or not, in an residential home, um, with a 20-year-old man or, 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 or girl, you need, to be, you need to be sensitive because you're talking about assigning, a, in their mind, this is a grandchild. And a grandchild does not look after, you know, should look after their grandmother or their grandfather. Give you my own practical example. When I was training, I was uh, I was on placement. On my very first day, in a um, in a in a what do you call it a um, what's a cancer board called again? It's gone completely gone. Um, oncology, non oncology ward. Um, I was I was I was training to be a, a clinician then, and um, on my first morning, my first duty was to look after a 75 year old, 76 year old woman from North London. Her name was Rebecca. I still remember her to this day. We are talking about 1982 here. And um, 
I, I opened the door, I opened the curtains, and I could see her go. <gasps> now, I was a nurse. You know, I was a qualified nurse. Or, or I was a, a nurse in training, really qualifying. And, and I knew exactly what she was going through. I was young. I was black. She was white. She was 76. We had problems right there and then. So what I did is I used a sense of humor. So I said to her, whoops, um, it's my first day. That's the first thing I said to her. It's my first day. And um, this is where I'm supposed to begin today. And I can see you are anxious. So I owned her feelings. I can see you're anxious. So I said to her, if it's okay, you tell me what you can do. And I will only help you do what you can't do. I could see her relaxing straight away. And she could do the top of her body quite easily without my help. So all I needed to make sure is that uh, I brought her warm water. It was on the right temperature. She had soap. She had a flannel. And I made sure there was a stool that wasn't going to, you know, with the wheels locked so the, the water doesn't run away when she's, when she's washing. And I said to her, when you're finished, just give me a call. So I, I went off the thing, closed the curtains, and let her get on with it. Because she assured me she could do it. And yes, she could do it. And then I said, and said to me, because I've got a problem with bending, if you can help me with my legs and feet, I'll be really grateful. This is my first day. Um, and then as, when I finished, I still remember what she said to me. She said to me, you know what? You are the first person ever since I came to this world two weeks ago who has asked me what I can do. They us just walk in and they do things to me and they walk out. Uh, Dr. Ayoya, you know what, what you are talking about, about that woman? That was exactly part of my experience. And there you go. Culturally, we were miles apart, but there was a humanity. I was able to focus on hangs that I was able to own and, and, and kind of a, 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 not stabilize, a, acknowledge. And, and, you know, and, and realize and accept her anxiety. And just in a moment of what, 35 seconds, we had rapport. And from then on, it was fine for me to look after after the, after the older people in that ward. So there you go. Culturally, we were miles apart. Age, we were miles apart. The only thing that differentiated me between her is that I was a clinician and she was a patient. That was me beginning to build my, my, my cultural intelligence. Um, I'll skip that one because I think I've said it already. Um, but I think the only thing I want to point is the second bullet point. Dr. Sashi Daran is a, a hero of mine, especially in the, in the delivery of uh, anti-discriminatory practice in mental health. He's a genius. If you read any of his stuff, uh, that's why I put a reference there, have a look. He's... This was in the context of racial equality, but it's also in terms of gender equality here, and also cross-cultural issues in psychiatry. Wonderful. And think of yourselves, you know, if you're a clinician and you're working somewhere from, from a community that's not your own, just be conscious that actually, although you live in the same country, kind of share broadly the same cultural context, there are, there are meanings and, and, and interpretations and perceptions you need to be aware of when you are when you are actually engaging with somebody from that context, all I want to say in this uh, is in this in this um, slide is that uh, to do that, when you begin to ask questions, get curious, get curious, understand meanings, begin to understand how people interpret signs and interpret language, you are beginning to create what I call you are taking accountability for your practice, you are taking accountability for ensuring that actually culturally you respect that person's background. But more importantly, you are developing cultural co capability and cultural competence. You're becoming cu culturally, rele culturally relevant. 
because that's really important. It doesn't come. You, 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 you've, you've got to, you've, a bit like you study psychiatry, you've got to begin to build your arsenal to be able to engage with people from different backgrounds, men, women, young people, older people, and so on. That's what I want to say from that slide. This kind of sums it up for me. And this is the last slide now. So, being aware of culture, yours is different from the other. Um, you live in a community. In Kenya, we have got 62 different, different types of communities. You know, we have got nomadic communities. We have got sanitary communities. We have got people who go to the garden every day. We have got people who mix, who mix herding and, 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 and uh, farming and so on. What's important exactly is you need to start to, to develop a knowledge base. That's where your capability and whatever comes in. You need to be sensitive to those languages, to those meanings, those understandings, to the values, the beliefs, and so on. You need to work to present yourself in an empathic way. Put yourself in the shoe of that person, like myself in that woman's, that woman's shoe. And then say, I don't know. Tell me, ask what would help. Ask what might make it comfortable. Say you don't know. What would somebody do in this particular case? Ask colleagues, maybe from that culture. Ask, ask colleagues on the ward. Maybe begin to develop a manual for your practice team that actually begins to give people intelligence about how you let people from Luoland or from Kisi or from Luoland or from Meru or from Kiambu or whatever. Uh, and it's all about, in that, you're beginning to create relationships good clinical relationships, but it's also good team relationships that actually inform you, you know, milk dry colleagues from another culture, you know, what that means, you know, you might go out with them and they meet somebody from their culture and they, um, you know, they might, you know, whatever, you know, they might say a word and they both react in a particular one to you doesn't make absolute sense. Ask the observant, be curious. These days, you know, a poa means a million things in Kenya now. When you say somebody about it, poa, about Zaleo, poa, everything is poa. When I was growing up, we used to call it shuari. It's all smooth. It's sailing okay. Um, and it's, it's, it's be curious about those meanings. See the relationships. See the relationships between young people, older people, whatever. <laughs> and then all that begins to inform the kind of treatment and therapy and clinical practice that uh, then you start engaging in. So, in summary, culture is everything that makes identify the person. Culture is summed up in language, interpretations, norms, values, beliefs. Cross-cultural uh, uh, cross practice in mental health is beginning to make sense and meanings and those interpretations owning them, asking, being curious, and saying, I don't know when you don't know. And just uh, be open to learning. I think I'll stop there. Right, hope, thank you. Thank you I so, so. <laughs> so, so much, Prof, for what uh, great insights um, around culture and mental health and uh, how we can understand that from the perspective that you've taught us as we continue to practice, uh, do our clinical practice. Amazing, amazing, uh, you know, just different voice, different uh, um, uh, knowledge, new knowledge. And uh, I'm just trying to add up for what we've been able to do. And I think the class, uh, I don't know what you feel. Any questions, comments? If you don't have a question, you can have a comment as we come to the end of this particular first session. Uh, let me allow people to have comments. Usually, preferably, I ask everybody to say something, whether a question or not. Uh, Kasim, how are you? And uh, any comment or question? Yes, very much. Uh, thank you, Amalimu, and thanks, Professor. Professor, I am actually mesmerized by this idea of empathy, that <laughs> empathy is rightly relevant yeah. in um, in uh, issues of cross uh, cross cultural capability and competence um that that captures me um in addition to all these other things that we've said thank you you're welcome okay. my friend thank you so much mugeni 
Mine is just to appreciate uh, the history he gave us. I, I didn't have that history and just the way he was narrating it, mm -hmm. it made a lot of sense. And I must say, thank you so much for enlightening us in that regard. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Yes, Damaris? Thank you for the for that lecture. It was very insightful. And I think what it brought out for me is the, I think maybe some of the things we actually think about, but not quite well conceptualized. For example, what stood out for me was um, culture being a causality and at the same time can be used as an aid for intervention when it comes to mental health and illnesses. Um, and, and that is something that I want to think about further. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. You're welcome. Wonderful. Daudi? Mulua? Uh, thank you, Prof, for that insightful uh, exposition as far as cultural barriers are concerned. I think I gained a lot from the historical perspective. I have been in Madari Hospital, yeah. and I saw patients walk from one corner to the other aimlessly. Uh, Sometimes you think they have a purpose. Sometimes they may not have a purpose. And I'm just wondering, that asylum act, that yeah. madness, could it be also being practiced in our society the mindset has never been, uh, you know, wiped out of us. Walk along the eager place looking at Madari fence, and you see those patients walking aimlessly. My imagination was pricked because of that. Mm. Number two, and I would like to appreciate, is acquisition of what you call cross-cultural intelligence <laughs> to the extent when I get a guy from uh, Mombasa, yeah, and then they say he shall. Does it yeah. only mean thank you or praise God? Probably they have more than what they are saying. Awesome. When I get a guy from some place I have never gone there in Ukambani, and they say Mount Unimadoku, culture tell you things are bad. Do they have mm -hmm. an hidden meaning? Yeah. Try to prosecute more, and try to learn and understand their culture. When they say there's no doctor who can treat psychotic issue from Ukambane, they can only take them the medicine men. What do they want to say? Thank you. You're welcome, my friend. That's really insightful. You're well done for that. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Joyce Kamoya, your comments or if you have a question. Um, I just want to appreciate Dr. My takeaway was um, the idioms of distress in regards to language, that someone might be speaking with their hands, like the Italians, and they are what they mean is very deep, but if you're not from that culture, you might struggle understanding that. That came out really well for me. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'd encourage you to think about, I mean, I was a bit in two months. Think of Kenya as different communities with different experiences. If you look closely, certain phrases and certain words mean certain things in certain areas. Right, very true. I guess we got a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you so much, Joyce. Judith Osok? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. for the insights and also uh, for giving us the history of uh, psychiatry and psychology in general. Um, my my take was the the narration about the empathic um, side that you bring into um, when you're handling an individual, understanding them from where they come from, and just allowing them to um, be themselves around you. and And I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Wonderful. Linda Onyoka? Is Linda in? Yes, I want to thank you for that presentation. A lot of things stuck out for me, but I'll just um, mention maybe two. The part where you said that uh, we should be sensitive to the languages and beliefs of people and just all, all, always think about... Um, 
like for example, the example you gave about Kenya, you know, like uh, people from various communities have different experiences that drive their emotions and their behavior. And for me, what is coming out is that even from a broader perspective, I think Kenyans in general just need to be more sensitive to people's experiences, our beliefs, our languages, and just tone down on the tribalism in general, because that is really something, uh, a subject of decay in our society. So I think if we practiced this and became just more sensitive towards each other, would overall have better relationships than another devoid of all these undertones that are uh, that really just rupture our society. And so if we can heal from the family level, and we can, if we can heal from society level, then even at our profession, we'll be having less incidences of this kind of nature, of this uh, nature to deal with, because we are practicing from the root, the root of yeah. our problem. And I'm only speaking for Kenya because that's what I know. There's a big problem, and this is really shedding light on how we need to behave, not just as professionals, but right from the social, from our family levels, just applying this from a broad base so that we can have better generations, people who are more culturally sensitive to one another and just overall better health outcomes. Thank you. If I can give you a phrase to sum this up for yourself is just remember this phrase. If you change the roots, you change the fruits. <laughs> Well, wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much, yes. uh, Linda, and of course, Prof coming in. Linda Opio. Um, Thank you so much, Professor, for just laying it all out very clearly. You know, almost I was thinking of a conveyor belt, you know, just <laughs> being able to connect uh, the dots very well from, you know, the different terminologies that were given around the mental health, you know, talking about lunacy, talking about, you know, madness, and now coming to a place where we actually beginning to embrace uh, mental health and give it a more, you know, decent, uh, quote unquote, word uh, attached to it. So thank you so much for that. And what has stuck for me is, you know, just the, 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 the item you brought out about being curious about meaning. Because when we deal with people from different cultures, we can only look at them or approach them with, you know, narrow lenses of looking at them from our own cultural standpoint. But you've brought it clearly in terms of just having that cultural curiosity and being curious also about certain meanings in different cultures. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Right. Thank you. And uh, Lydia Nana. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that very insightful um, talk on uh, on culture. It has just brought it all together at the end of, us, of the semester, everything that we have been learning in one lecture, and we are very grateful. For me, uh, what has stood out, one is just, I'll just say it as a statement that they start poor and end up mad because of the way society treats them as they just go out to bed. That for some reason has stuck with me and on a sad note because it's the interpretation that culture has given to those who are experiencing uh, lack. And then the other one is to look out for in a, on a positive note, to look out for what culture, cultural supports exist for mental wellness and from this, I took the example of the postpartum support that's given to women. Yeah. Right now, postpartum depression has become such a big thing, and it could very well be it's because of the lack of that support that existed culturally. So I'm I'm taking out that culture does have some solutions to um, mental health, uh, some mental health challenges if we care to look. Thank you. Just give me a second. Carry on, Prof. Carry on, Dr. Lamka. Okay, yes, and um, that was Mil, uh, that was uh, Linda. Milka? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Lu, and also I guess now I will say thank you for bringing us prof, uh, because uh, what I wanted to say, to tell him is that um, I have seen him, like listening to him and looking at him, uh, I saw him as an agent 
of the cultural intelligence as he was talking about it. And I I listened to him as a person now who's walked the journey and coming to us like a tool in himself, like a tool. You know, I was looking at him and thinking like the way a qualitative researcher is in his in their research that they are they are part of it and so i like the fact that professor has come in here as a tool or as an agent of cultural intelligence and the competence so that's what i was seeing from him and even as he put in he, he threw in you know uh, bits of his history you know coming from kenya and uh, working in the uk uh, that is cross cultures uh, yeah. indeed and and therefore looking at you and saying halakumbe it is possible you know to even become a, a practitioner in the uk from kenya i've been wondering really how is that possible um uh, where can i begin from and i think what you have said is be curious be open to learning that is what i gathered here and therefore really appreciate i was also listening and wondering um what could be happening if we compare kenya where although we are beginning the individualistic kind of culture. I know the UK and other Western places are far ahead in that, that the community thing is, fa fabric is, is, is torn. So therefore, what is this doing to the mental health, you know, prevalences and, you know, the geography of mental health? So thank you, Prof. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you, Anas. Well, um, I'm not sure I have adequate words to 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 you. However, for me, was the revelation that the Kenyan, you know, bringing it home, Africa at large, is bound to the earth, to the mundane, and to the transcendent. So, viewing the client from that perspective allows for cultural intelligence. I think that that was eight for me. Well, if in the next session I have someone from the East, then I must look for the balance, mind, body, and, you know, and, um, and spirit, or, or the, it's a different view. I need to be able to shift from client one at eight to nine and client two at 9.30 to 10.30 because of who they are and what they connect with. So I think for me that that was the thing that just blew me off, that the African, the Kenyan, is bound to the land and to God and the spirit and the transcendent, while it's entirely different from the West and from the East. So thank you so very much, Professor. For just an example to tell you, now in our psychiatric services here, um, what, when we fought hard, one of the requirements now is that actually in any hospital, there has to be a place for uh, a Muslim to pray, a Hindu to pray, a Christian to pray, mm. or even if, or even if there's a shared facility, they have got times for those people to pray, and that's that's now a part of the standard of providing mental health here in inpatient care. Wow! So that that means then that um, together with the pharmacology, you you have brought in the transcendent, correct, along with the people, correct. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, uh, Priscilla. Thank you, Prof. Um, for me, what stood out for me is the way we bring in our mindfulness to our room. It didn't just emerge from somewhere. It's for the, you called it the Eastern philosophy of mindfulness, yoga, exercise as part of alternative medicine. And also in terms of um, our, the alternative medicine, also traditional medicine and therapies from other cultures as a way of treating the whole person in, according to their mind, body, and soul. So that's, that's an amazing thing, and thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Sarah. I think for me, I have learned... Uh, a bit about cultural variations that uh, mental health is not a universal concept. Um, 
and, and it's influenced by cultural norms, values, and practices. So when you explore this intersection of mental health and culture, it reveals how different societies define uh, uh, or perceive and also how they respond to mental health challenges. So basically, um, this lecture has deepened my understanding um, my understanding of complexities that surround mental health. And it inspires me, you know, to approach mental health with empathy, with cultural humility, and a commitment to uh, promoting a mental well-being uh, for everyone and for all my clients. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Tess? Yes, thank you, Dr. Iya, and thank you, Paul, for um, that insightful presentation. My my take home is the, the last slide that is already there. Okay. Yes, yes. The fact that um, enriching our knowledge base regarding the values, the beliefs, interpretation, and meaning that clients bring to their is the key is that the onus lies in the alleged base to help the client. Okay. No, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, this and Tina. Thank you, Dr. Tari, for uh, this presentation and professor. Um, enchanted by the whole aspect of culture and mental health in prevention and treatment. In particular, I liked um, the example you gave about this lady in the village and how she survived uh, the mental illness just by care and being in the house and the culture accepting that she was old. And so being taken care of seems normal, even if you know she was still suffering from mental illness. And so, um, when you look at it today, the culture can really play a big role in uh, advocating for a safe space for those who are going through mental illness and also for prevention. That was uh, a big takeaway. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And finally, uh, Turu. Yes, thank you, Dr. Tari. Thank you, Prof, for uh, being our guest today. I have really learned a lot just how sensitive multiculturalism is. And uh, this was an emphasis of the importance of the study, uh, learning other people's culture, their donation. What are they meaning even as they come for therapy? What are they meaning as they are saying different things? You know, the spiritual beliefs, their idioms of expression, and also, um, you know, it actually made me uh, appreciate the history that has taken place over time. And the examples that you gave were really profound, um, something that will stick in my mind. And so just the, 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 the realization that I need to be informed as a therapist uh, with the current multicultural changes in regards to different cultures, um, like you mentioned, you would uh, say, things are shwari, you know, in the past, mm -hmm. things have changed, you know, uh, it would mean something different. And so we yeah. need to be informed. And for me, it, it's it's quite a task to just take that uh, responsibility upon myself as a therapist to decide to, um, to be informed and to constantly know what is changing, you know, in the various cultures and not to just assume Otherwise, I lose my client, and the rapport will not be uh, quite built quite well, and as well as the trust. And so, um, finally, just what you had told one of my colleagues, uh, Linda, you know, and and also the quotes, you know, uh, they 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 stood out for me. You know, act as if you are, and you will attract it to you. And if you act as if you are, you will become. That is one of uh, the the quotes you mentioned, and the the one that you said, if you change the roots, you change the fruits. So thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank, thank you, it's a privilege. So I am. 
because we are, we are because I am. Yeah. And uh, that is the culture. So, uh, Prof, thank you so much for, uh, you know, uh, can you can get, hear. Can I just yeah, have two you, minutes? Just some of a couple of... Okay. A couple of your yes. products are really important. Yes. Just give me literally three minutes. One That's is okay. uh, really, really important is um, I want you to begin to think in terms of mental health as opposed mm -hmm. to illness because it's really important sometimes because if we focus on the mental health bit, we will minimize the illness or mm -hmm. we will minimize very much how we relate to other people. Point mm -hmm. number two, you are, the person in front of you, if they're clinically unwell, First and foremost, they're a human being and not a set of symptoms. Mm -hmm. That's really clear. And I'll tell you why. Two things. My mom used to, it always fascinates me. This is how I got into psychiatry. We had a guy who was unwell in PC. And I didn't know him until I'd done psychiatry. He suffered from, you know, uh, paranoid schizophrenia. And whenever he terrified the whole town whenever anybody he used to run after people. But the thing that completely blew my mind was. Whenever my mom met him, he looked, she looked him straight in the eye and told him, Martin, behave yourself, stop frightening people. And he always listened to her. And I could never figure out how on earth she could engage this person who everybody was petrified of. And it's only years later I began to realize she saw him first, not what he did. And because she saw him as a human being, Somehow he picked it up and it didn't frighten him. And he used to sit around buy a cup of jam, some mandazi, and it was fine. And I remember going back to Kenya years later, and he had turned up to about 78 now, 80, nearly 80. And I was walking down one of the back alleys and he stopped me. And he said to me, you're Anna's son, aren't you? You can imagine what went through my mind. He saw me as a 13-year-old young man, and I was nearly 35, and he still recognized me, and he letted me from my mom. And I, So it's a human being. Another example was I gave a hug to a 27-year-old woman when I was working in acute psychiatry in the middle of a ward. And I got told off because uh, it was breaking boundaries and so on. But what I saw was a frightened, um, uncertain, petrified woman who was concerned about losing her. We had collected her from a train station in, in London where she had cut her wrist, which was just waiting to die. And I gave her a hug. And to cut a long story short, I got into trouble about it, but then I explained one good argument because I said, look, at the end of the day, we are dealing with a human being with emotions, and emotions are our pathway in terms of how we begin to get to, to touch with other people. By giving her that hug, it was a saying to you, you are a human being, I hear you, without saying a word. Now, the thing that really, really hit me was nearly 20 years later, she, she was been looking for me, this was in 1984, uh, about 2004, I was working at the Department of Health, and she came downstairs and was looking for Joe, and she said to them, can you tell, can you tell him free and hospital? And the name is Claire. And as soon as they say that name, I knew who it was. And she had been looking for me all this time, and all she wanted to say were two words, Thank you. And all because I was a human being to her. Not because I gave her therapy, not because I gave her injection, not because I took her for occupational therapy, but it's because I acknowledged her to be a human being. Every time I talk about that, it gets me very emotional because you never know how you impact somebody because you're a human being. Emotions are important. That thing I want to say is our environment shapes us. And therefore, the kind of environment you create in terms of where, where you practice and uh, creating a safe environment for people feeling welcome is really, really important. But first and foremost, you are a human being and not a therapist. That's a good place to start. Home in on the human being. Uh, and uh, you, you, can't pos you cannot possibly get it wrong if you, if you home in on the human being. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Sorry. All right, thank you so much. You can remove, you can stop sharing.
Okay, so fine. Sorry. Yeah. I can just stop uh, sharing somewhere there. Uh, yep. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So thank you so much. I think uh uh, uh I guess I'll give Naz Naz um you can say on behalf of the class so that we can also have uh, what time is it, Joe? Your class? It is uh, my in my neck of the woods, it is uh six minutes to six. So you're heading for nearly eight o'clock your end. Okay. So uh, Naz is the president of this class and the leader of this class. Uh, you, Naz, uh, um, personally, first, I want to say thank you so much, Prof, for coming in. And you've always been there at the River, Nairobi. You've always hit the short, short courses. I've attended your short courses when you're in Kenya. And they, of course, the kind of people we have had, our friendships are almost the same, uh, whether you talk about uh, 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 Prof and other people you've interacted with around. That has always made me know you more and the concern you have for mental health in Kenya, where you've been insisting, with, other than other than this training, like the professional clinical psychology, how, what is it we can do to reduce the gap of mental health? And your approach has been, can we train first aiders? You know, they may not necessarily acquire this PhD. They may not acquire a master's in PhD. They may not, I mean, a master's in clinical psychology or counseling psychology or even social mental work, mental, social work mental, in mental health. They may not acquire even a degree. They may not acquire a PhD. But yet we need to have certain, like in the like way community health has, the community health workers, people who gap up this so that now we can reduce this. It, it may not be achieved, but they can be able to handle clients at a certain level, as they bring them to now Sarah or Linda or Damaris or Priscilla, you as has been, there's a way we can try. You see, uh, community, uh, the medical, the medical, um, the medical uh, 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 profession has gone by having community health workers who reduce that so that by the time they get to now the clinic, at least some, uh, some areas of first aid and ETC can be done. But now in mental health, we know that people must be qualified. But a short course is not enough. We just want those skills that someone can have and say, I can know that that man that is, is, is always chasing people. That's a mental health problem. Let's see where we can transport and help. How can we be able? And I think that has been your, your, your agenda. We haven't yeah. really been there to get to say, can we train nurses? Can we train uh, uh, teachers? Can we train community health workers, can we train, uh, you know, people who can help just gap up. It's like they offer a first aid, if I put in bracket, of mental health before they get the clinician who is going to offer real uh, therapy and support for that particular. And that's something I've really hoped that we can try to do, um, you know, uh, so that people can understand the basics, you know, as long as they have the skills, but they can be able to support to reduce the burden not necessarily giving any professional help, but they can be able to showcase where do you go for mental health, who can support you. But meanwhile, there is a child, uh, there's a bipolar, uh, there's someone who has bipolar in the community and now something has happened. What else can we do just support him as we get him to the nearest support system of a professional mental health? Maybe calm the community, calm the people around, say, now we need to do this. That thing that has been your, uh, your dream to see where Kenyans will train people or Africa will have people who can be able to understand basics of mental health as they approach to give a client to very specified and special people who can offer now professional support system. So really, uh, that's one thing that I admire about and what you've been trying in small ways because you can reach everybody, but I think it's something we're trying. And we were looking at it as we are trying to call what a certificate or something in community mental health, you know, something like that, you know, trying to coin it up to bring it in, um, but thank you so much. Uh, Naz, is there something you want to say, uh, Prof, and then Prof, you can say the last word, then I can stop the recording and ask the students how we can proceed on because of our time. Okay, so uh, you want me to go first? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, wow, I, I, um, I'm sure this is a gem and, and thank you first for, for, stream, you know, for, for streaming this live. Because this goes um into you know into the archives. And this is something we can go back to and and do yeah. on it over and over and over again for years. Um I, there's a paper that I have just uh, written 
and it's been accepted for publishing. And I really struggled with this title because it was constructing meaning to enhance mental wellness for Christian widows in Kenya. And finally, I found somebody who said the church has a place where people can be put. So um, I think it's timely. This conversation is timely. And I'm hoping that out of um, the 18 of us, you will get some ambassadors who will carry on that dream that uh, Dr. Ayuya is talking about, that people can get help, first aiders, who will come in place. Maybe the church can do that. Well, who knows? But that it's not left to the expert, quote unquote, to understand mental health in our community. Thank you so much, Professor. What you have shared with us in that um, about one and a half hours, you have earned ears and ears and ears to synthesize that and bring it out. So we are eternally grateful for this experience. And uh, I'm sure that when Dr. Caroline calls you again, you will show up for us. <laughs> <laughs> I am really, as, really hoping so. As um, a promise. Thank you. Thank you. There's something you say that um, Dr. Ayuya usually says, ask the client, what can I learn from you? I always yeah. wonder, what does that exactly mean? You know? And, and finally, this makes sense that people are completely different because of who they are structured to be. Yeah, That's why I said I'm not sure I have enough words. What you have brought us is years and years and years of synthesis of experience and conviction. So thank you over and over and over. May it just ring in your head and um, may God bless you just for what you did for us. Thank you. Dr. Ayuya, you're a gem. Just allow me <laughs> to put it that way. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, Joe, you want to say something to the candidates who are also, yeah. this is their final, not necessarily final, but this is what is going to lead them also towards their sitting up for their comps, uh, comprehensive exams. Uh, they have only one semester to move out of the system as they'll be their dissertations. Uh, but what else that, can you tell them in a minute or so? First of all, I'll say, uh, well done. I, I want to honor you for being here today. It's eight o'clock. I know it's a long, a long day, uh, but something worth doing is worth doing. So I want to honor you for being here. Two, I want to wish you every best for your exams and for your degree. Uh, you know, what you do is do what, just show up and show up your best. You have no control of what the outcome is. But as I said, that's why I began with the statement, act as if you are, and you will attract it to you. And if you act as you are, you'll become. That's all you have got, that you have got control over. Uh, and it's all about emotions. The second bit I wanted to say is, um, sometimes I know people when I say actually mental health, sometimes, sometimes professionals complicate mental health. Actually, it's very easy. Now, don't get me wrong. It's very easy to actually start with the human being. Here, the human being. Um, and the thing that drives me every day in mental health is um, Maya Angelou's phrase. And I can't remember the exact one. I say something about when I meet with somebody, it's not what they say. It's not what they do. It's how they make me feel. That's what... In mental health practice, that's what always will happen. I can guarantee you that. It's not so much the therapy you provide. It is how you make that person feel when they're in therapy with you. Do not underestimate. That's, that's, that's the first step towards recovery. That's the first step towards wellness. The, the other thing I want to say to you is... Um, if it's okay with uh, Dr. Ayi and yourselves, I am planning to come to Kenya. Um, well, actually, no. First of all, I say, if this class wants me to um, explore a particular area of mental health, uh, by all means, arrange it and so on, I'll be happy to do that. What I'd really like, just to go back to what Dr. Ayi said about actually, what do we do in Kenya to make something, some inroads? If it's okay with you, there's how many of you want the class? There is... 14 of you, 18 of you. Um, just need to have a look at. I'm giving you an invitation. There's 18 of you. If it's okay with you, Dr. Ayuya, and I promise I will not abuse this. 
if you can give Dr. Ajuya your emails, yeah, I will put you in a group in my system and um, I will start communicating with you about issues around mental health. And I like to, I like to, I like to explore the question you raised about Dr. Ajuya about, about how, how do we begin slowly? And when I'm in Kenya, I'd be able to gather all of you together and really go to town about um, beginning to picture something out. Um, it's not beyond us. It's about it's about um, helping people to appreciate actually the simplicity. I, I'll give you the example of a mom who has given birth and the women coming and helping them out. Um, young people playing football. You know, we, one of the biggest um, uh, um, programs we set here around um, providing people psychological therapies was to was to to make um, hairdressers aware of mental well-being, and um, so we, we invited them. We, we we told them what people feel like when they're unwell and so on. Now, if you can imagine your own experience, when you go to a hairdresser salon, the hairdresser is working on you, and you're talking to them, and you're talking to them. You're talking them about their children, you know, what they don't like and they don't like Ruto and they like so and so. And, and that process is a therapeutic process. And do you know what happens? It's not so much about the style of hair that you, you get when you, but when you go out of there, your emotions are depleted. And I can guarantee you, we have got people through a lot of psychological, basic psychological therapy input by using hairdressers. Oh. They are not experienced. They are not experienced. They are not trained clinicians, but we just give them an understanding and how to structure a conversation, and sometimes just to listen to the person offload. And every single feedback was when I left the hairdressers, I like going to my hairdresser because she, you know, she makes me feel good. That was the that was the phrase that kept coming out. <laughs> she makes me feel good. So if, if if you can gather that, I, I'll certainly bring you together. There's a good number of you. Let's uh, set up a half a day and um, hopefully we can do it in days or somewhere. Half a day and let's really kind of do some thinking because I think right here, you have got 18 people who could actually revolutionize mental health in Western Kenya. That's my challenge to you. Right, thank you so much, Prof. And uh, obviously, when you come here, this class, I'll bring them together, not just this, but more of this, because I know yeah. what you've been trying to do yeah. uh, at other places, like University of Nairobi, amongst others, and among, of course, us professionals. We'll be very glad to host you so that uh, we can have a, a, some kind of uh, um, uh, our own creating pathways towards reducing the burden of mental health in Kenya yeah. and trying to see how that can be able to come up with a model or uh, a curricula that can be adopted by other people uh, to help us, you know, scale and reduce the burden of mental health. As I said, they may not, they will not be experts, they will not be professionals, but they still are able to help, you know, just like well, midwives, you know, they help, they end up helping women deliver in the end, but they are not, not, they're not going to any training, but just a little training alone really, really helps. And what we're trying to do is midwifery around mental health. That's what yeah. we're trying to do. So thank you so much. And um, 